Um, uh, so you're going to just ignore the rest of it and just <laughs> focus on the part that suits your arguments. Well, that's all that you mentioned. <laughs> I, and the Japanese. On, talking, f- we, feel free to mention. I that. haven't got an example, but right. I'm t- but he, t- he talks about the <laughs> the Japanese and the Chinese governments okay, have well, lower spectrum costs, if, <laughs> and if that's it, why. If it's all right, I'll just run with the Chinese point I was going to make. You two, which stop flirting. Which is there is this sort of planned economy. So. Hello and welcome to another telecoms.com podcast. Um, just to remind you that if you're watching the podcast on the site or on YouTube, you can also listen to it on iTunes or SoundCloud, and vice versa, if you listen to it, you can watch it on the site. Um, we're going to make this one reasonably short and sweet because they're about to tear down our offices in about three quarters an hour, so we've got to get on with it. And by the way, if you hear any banging in the background, that's symptomatic of it. We have a special guest this week. We've got Paul Nolan from CC Group. Hi, Paul. Hello, Scott. Uh, you're just fresh off the plane, aren't you? Uh, fresh is a yeah, it's a dangerous word. Fresh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, Paul's here. He's, he's going to join in the general chit chat. But you've also got a little bit of research that your company's done about sort of digital transformation. That but great. that reminds me, I've got to do PA. I've got to do your upfronts. So we can talk about digital transformation with Paul. Then I'm going to talk about my trip. I was also travelling this week. My trip to uh, California with Qualcomm. And then Jamie's going to tell us about everything else that's been going on this week, including some stuff Huawei's been saying and maybe a bit of Twitter. Okay. Right. So we will just crack on. So Paul. Um, you uh, you did some research. Just give us a top line on what it's all about. Well, we have uh, a lot of network vendors as clients, and it's become increasingly apparent over the last 18 months or more that they are all a little bit preoccupied with the term that is digital transformation. Oh, yes. And how can they help carriers become trendier uh, and actually migrate towards becoming digital service providers? Stop me if you've heard it, won't you? Well, you, can, you can assume I've heard it a million times, <laughs> exactly. but that's all right. Our listeners hopefully are not as jaded as we are. No, well, actually, we have an awful lot of sympathy for our clients that are trying to sell to these. Uh, these these companies that are trying to work out what it is that they want to be when they grow up and we thought it'd be interesting to actually ask the operators how they feel they're getting on as far as right. the migration to becoming uh, digital service providers. So let's just going. let's just quickly sort of backtrack on the terminology assuming that not everyone's heard it as often as I have. What what is a digital service provider and how is that different from how they have been prior to that? Well, my, a dumbed down version which is yes, which is which is a PR obviously specialism. <laughs> um, it's look, I mean Operators have been pilloried forever about not being, you know, fast enough, not being agile enough, right. not being sexy enough. Right. They you know, have obviously sacrificed an awful lot of revenue to uh, the internet companies. Uh, oh, obviously they're all obvious. I don't have to tell you exactly who they are. No, no. Well, uh, my sector media has probably sacrificed even more. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Well, it's always, I mean, I think that much like everything else in the telecoms industry, like the, the, the operator community are being driven by what, you know, consumers expect them to be. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, trying to kind of meet this, you know, increasing impulsiveness for all things all the time, yeah. you know, faster, better, fatter, whatever. And I think operators have taken a bit of a, taken their own sweet time, frankly, about yeah. actually emulating those capabilities and proving that they can be more than just these kind of traditional siloed organisations yeah. that don't talk to each other or anybody else. And part of the sort of cultural problem they got is, you know, as recently as sort of 15, 20 years ago, you had a mobile phone and they pretty much controlled the whole sort of commercial channel. You're not going to say wall garden, are you, Scott? Oh, well, well I can if you want. Yeah, if God, let's do it. Let's do it for old <laughs> time's sake. You had, you, had the, you had your wall garden. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and then obviously we started using phones as little um, handheld computers, and then we had access to the entire internet over the phones, which obviously wasn't controlled within the confines of this wall guard, and that's that's where it created the massive sort of competitive problem for them. And and you're saying that they've they've been slow to sort of get with the program and, well, and adjust to that. Two sides are looking at it. Yes, they probably have been slow, but at the same time, it's an awful it's a massively big thing to try and comprehend, right? When you've operated the business for the same amount of time, um, doing the same things to the same types of users, um, having the kind of courage to do something in a radically different way, you know, takes some doing. And you're, you're seeing, you know, most of the operators actually, you know, trying to get as much new talent in from outside the organization yeah. to try and convince them that, uh, you know, doing things in a different way is ultimately possible. Um, but then I, cu- culturally just hiring someone from... Facebook or, or whatever <laughs> doesn't yeah. necessarily solve the problem, does it? Not, not at once, no. You've got to be able but, to listen to them for but, starters. But that, that is a case in point, right? What we wanted to do is look at how much actual you know, churn has been going on internally in terms of the operators bringing in new talent, right? And how have they kind of restructured themselves to you know, make themselves uh, or give themselves a better chance of being successful in becoming yeah. a digital, um, digital service provider? 
and we've got you know some some operators within the study saying that they've like restructured two or three times in the last three years yeah. and that they've actually changed leadership like two or three times within the same time frame it gives you a kind of clear sense in terms of why um, they're kind of struggling with it a little bit but what does that mean to the vendors that are yeah. trying to sell to them and that's that's really where we where, where we started at because we needed to empathize with our clients right, and really try and understand the world in which they're in um, and I suppose so from a PR perspective try and give some practical advice about how they can actually reach the decision makers within this constantly churning operator mm. environment and uh, are, are, have you started giving this advice yet? <laughs> well I mean look one of the main th this, this research is pretty fresh isn't it? It's fresh yeah I mean yeah. It, literally launching it on Monday I mean okay. we, we did it with an independent um, research company called Insight Avenue um, we um, managed to survey, I think it was 60, 69 uh, decision makers within global operators. We're talking C-suite and just below. Um, and we asked them, we wanted to understand you know, how much how much flux have they been going through? Mm -hmm. you know, how many different, uh, how many new people, how many new departments have been created? You know, what is the average time taken to make a purchasing decision when actually talking to the vendor community? Because um, you know, all of our clients keep telling us that you know the sales cycles are getting longer and longer and longer. This is, not, this is an operator buying from a vendor. This is. A this is an operator buying from a vendor, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, there's there's, there's a there's a number of different things at play. There are more people within um, the, the the buying decision making within the op from an operator perspective. There are more vendors that are trying to convince the operators that they can do things better. Um, and there is, you know, obviously lots and lots of different technological approaches. Um, and there is a bit of a kind of a frustration being felt amongst the vendors but also within the operators in terms of who's actually making the decisions why do so many people need to be involved in yeah. so many decisions and you know how on earth do vendors manage to kind of shape a message to so many people within such a massively um, you know time consuming process how do they make sure that each of the mm. different decision makers within this like uh, within within this kind of uh, within this buying cycle how can they actually be certain that they're being perceived in the right way. Yeah, yeah. So, so I disagree with you slightly there in that it's, I don't think it's that there's too many decision makers. I think that they're just terrified of getting it wrong. Well, that's... Uh, I think that is, I think that is the fundamental that's exactly, that's problem. That's entirely fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The fundamental problem with telecoms is that they want the silver bullet every time. And, you know, every, all the most successful companies in the world now never get it right the first time. You know, Google... How long was Google around before it made Bing and Ask Jeeves and all that and Yahoo irrelevant? You know, it was around for a couple of years. It had to refine its business model. Yeah, and everyone has to sort of fail fast. You yeah, know, like Amazon with its phone and that sort of thing. But they're not afraid to do that. So, yeah. I mean, the idea is, you know, we try we try a piece of technology. Look at Google. Look at Google Fiber. They're onto their third CEO in just over a year, and they're still trying to crack mm. it. You know, they're they're saying, right, okay, we're going to plow. 300 million into this because we know in 10 years time it might be worth 10 billion yeah it might not be well, worth anything it's a vc approach isn't it yeah yeah i mean vcs normally say you just get a one in 10 hit rate but that one yeah pays that for one all the other failures yeah and that and that's the mentality which we you know why i think the operators are failing at the moment and let's do risk averse no, it's yeah it's cultural you know it's always been yeah. the same way and it goes back to what we were saying about the traditional silo mentality uh, heaven help you if you want to talk to somebody else about what it is you're trying to achieve uh, yeah, and well, I, I mean the the average number of people within an operator involved in each purchasing decision is thirty eight, and in some instances it can be more than a hundred. Wow! You just think about how do you manage a sales cycle involving a hundred different. And you're supposed to be all, all agile and DevOps, and then you got a, and <laughs> yeah. then you got to loop in a hundred other dudes to get anything right. done. Right. Yeah, and um, and I think sometimes I always remember like way back when I sort of knew far less about the industry, I remember covering an initiative by Vodafone, which they called something like Vodafone 360 or something like that. Yep. And they chucked a bunch of money at it. They were like wall-to-wall -wall TV ads that all for some reason featured ginger people, which you'd have to ask their ad agency what the thinking there was. Not that I got anything wrong with... It's a red ginger. brand. 
Uh, maybe hats. that's it. Maybe that's it. They're just associating it with their brand. Um, if so, that's sort of crude imagery, isn't it? Look, red people. Anyway, um, but it basically completely failed. And one of the reasons it failed is it, there, there was this real sense, even then, for me, of we're doing this because we feel we should, rather than because there's any real conviction or right. real sort of higher thought that's gone behind it. So I guess that's the other problem they've got, is they're sort of chasing their tails a little bit. And that, and that definitely... Um, coincides with Jamie's point about being risk averse because if you are risk averse then you're doomed to be a try and be a fast follower at best aren't you mm, yeah and uh, the only way you're going to be an innovator and be ahead of the pack is to take risks but that's the thing they just got comfortable I think you know you look at the the 80s and 90s and the early noughties you know the 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 tech was taking over the world you know finance defined you know, the economy for the years before that and manufacturing before right. that. And then technology was starting to emerge as the defining part of any economy. And then all of a sudden, the telcos were at the top. Yep. And then they got comfortable. They, they didn't do what Google and Amazon are doing yeah. now. They're looking for differentiation before they need to look for differentiation. And then all of a sudden, the world changed and the telcos weren't ready. And I think they've just been playing catch up ever since. Yep, fair enough. And also be massively worried about what their customers might think of trying something different as well, right? Yeah. Keep coming back to this, you know, the, the trust that is built you know, between an operator and the customer has always been that kind of singly defining yeah. principle that they're fiercely proud of. You know, and you keep talking about the billing relationship, the yep. lots and lots of different types of data that, you know, operators are trusted to hold and everything else. And moving from that to the fail fast world that you describe, yeah. you know, as far as you know, the Google models are concerned, it's uh, it's just massively uncomfortable for. But them. I, but I, I, but I think rather than uh, rather than it being uncomfortable for them, I think that gives them even more validation to try these new things. You know, you know, the idea of launching new content content services. You know, Netflix had to do a huge amount to earn the trust before it could actually, right. uh, you know. Be that billing relationship, and people would trust them with their credit cards. Yeah. You know, the the telcos have always had that trust, so therefore that should have been the valid validation, the justification to jump on the content train before anyone else did, because they were in such a better position. They just got lazy, weren't, in, weren't willing to invest in new areas, and now they're they're falling massively behind. Well, it's interesting you talk about billing. Um, I'll give give Paul an easy shout out because th there's a direct reference to one of your clients. Oh, open you, you're too kind. <laughs> it's all right. You can you can buy me a beer. <laughs> um, but you know, I know OpenNet. One of their biggest sort of external communication narratives is trying to sort of shake up that that paradigm between the vendors. They're, they're a BSS vendor, aren't they? They are between the vendor and the operator. You know, I'm certainly not going to start regurgitating their particular message partly because I can't remember it. But I think you know, I think that is interesting. And from a billing point of view. I sometimes wonder how much scope there is for operators to innovate to me beyond billing. Like I was, I was, so I was just over in San Diego and straight away I'm with EE, straight away they sent me a text message when I arrived going that you've already signed up to this international roaming thing, we'll do you for a, a fiver a day for about 500 megs of data and I was like yeah alright, a bit presumptuous of them to just yeah. kick it in straight away but then fiver a day I can handle that and then one day I've mistakenly sort of downloaded a podcast I thought I was doing it over Wi-Fi, but it ended up being over the network, and I used it up, and then I straight away got a text message, which was really easy to implement for me to buy more, and I ended up dropping another tenner. So they got all this sort of 20 or 30 quid out of me, mainly by making it so easy for me to spend the money. So they weren't necessarily adding an amazing service. It sounds like a personalised contextual offer to me, doesn't it? Is that what it is? No, well, I've, I've heard. Yeah, There's yeah. a rumour going around. Which is presumably something that BSS does, isn't it? Well, well I've, I've heard. Yeah, 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 yeah there yeah, we go. Yeah. So there's an example of something that did work well. It's quite small, and you know they're not going to get 30 quid out of me all the time, because obviously when I go in Europe, it's... Is there's no roaming charges, but but, but they got thirty quid they wouldn't have got otherwise. That's exactly it, right? And it's that kind of process that sits at the heart of you know, this kind of aspirational need for operators to become DSPs, right? It's exactly right. that. It's how do you capitalise on impulsiveness, right? How do you actually use what you know about a customer to make yourself more effective from a from a monetization perspective? So this is the thing. I I I completely agree with you there. Impulse buys. There's a massive massive opportunity. I mean, look at. I mean. Christ, Amazon, how much money do they make off impulse buys? Mm. You know, because you bought this, would you like to buy this? I mean, I know it, yeah. it sickens you and it really <laughs> annoys you that they're not very good at it, but I reckon... What, you mean that the algorithms yeah. normally offer you something you've just already yeah. bought or something but like that? But they must yeah. they must make so much money yeah. off those impulse buys. But I think it, you can go one step further in that um, the, the, the entire 
they know their customers so well that they could have and they have that element of trust that they could have sort of like created these opportunities years ago and i think over the next one thing there's my prediction over the next uh over the uh the next couple of years yep. i think spotify is going to cause all sorts of problems so you've seen them they started in music right now they've started venturing into um uh into podcasts and all right. that sort of thing radio shows various live live streaming on radio i don't think it'll be too long and i don't think it's a huge jump for them to offer video content for their premium uh, subscription right. services maybe things well, like live events on video and yeah stuff. live events all that sort of thing which i think will be which is which is a perfectly logical step for them just like it was a logical step for the telcos years ago yeah. but now because they've justified the billing relationship with the consumer they can make that logical mm -hmm. step and it's just you know the, right, so. the internet giants are just so much better at moving more yeah. fluidly yeah, no, I think I think we all agree on that. I'm gonna because we're short time. I'm gonna move it on a bit, but I'm gonna give you sort of another opportunity, Paul. If there's anything else from your research, any little sort of factoids or data points or whatever that you think's worth flagging, or just conclusions off the top of your head. Well, I mean, look, I mean, the the the, the, the paper itself is gonna go is gonna go live on Monday, and it's got a number of different recommendations to vendors in terms of what they can do to make themselves more attractive to operators and how they can make themselves appear as innovative as possible, and you know. Obviously, um, you know, from a PR standpoint, you know, being having coherent communications uh, strategies yeah. in place is a big part of that, and actually understanding who your customer is and what type of message is going to resonate with each of those individuals, particularly if you're dealing with 38 people on average per yeah. per purchasing cycle, then you really, really do need to get your act together in terms of you know, what, what you need to be saying to who. And also, and this is a shout out for you guys, which you might find interesting, okay. in terms of Returning all- Returning the favor. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, well, this is, this is good for both of us, actually. Okay. And it, I was actually pleasantly surprised by it. If you look at all of the different channels that operators look to in terms of helping them um, helping build influence f uh, around um, different vendors and how they're perceived. 73% um, of the operators surveyed said that the trade media is the most helpful source of information oh. when shortlisting vendors. That is good news. Which is fabulous news. And it, it, it pales into con insignificance the business media as well. It seems to that there is so much um, commentary about you know, what different operators are doing and indeed what you know, the competition right. is doing that yeah, we're having all summarised by a, you know, cynical swines like the two of you <laughs> is actually exactly what they're after well that's really good to hear I mean it is nice to hear because sometimes you know we, we all know that over the over the years decades journalism as a profession has lost a lot of writers partly because of these OTTs you know they've come and nicked our cash that's right I think like the majority of all ad spend in the states is done with just google and facebook now or yeah. digital ad spend um uh, two two thirds globally is done with google and facebook right okay well there we are it's even seem worse than i thought um so it's nice to have um an, an endorsement from the people that we're trying to address that that they actually that we actually are vaguely useful yeah because uh it's, it's not always obvious so hurrah for that <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Thank okay. For independent research, then. You what? Thank heads. Thank yes, well, for indeed. Independent research. Although, although, not that I'm implying this with yours, but independent sometimes needs to be in inverted commas with some <laughs> of the research that I get in. There goes that cynicism again. Well, that's part of our job to put those inverted commas in, isn't it? Can I get an email? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So moving on to me. So, you, you, oh, actually, no, before we move on, I want to ask you. You've been flying around. You just got in. From New Jersey, I did, and yes. you were uh, and you were out on the piss with a a, a past podder of ours, Mary Clark, uh, indeed, yes. who's who's now moved to Synchronos, indeed, she about, has about which I've written some some interesting pieces in the past, indeed, you have, but I'm not going to ask you any awkward questions <laughs> about any of that. Don't you worry. I just want to know what you got up to because you guys, you and Mary and Richard Fogg, your colleague uh, yep. um, at CC, have been tweeting about how basically strongly implying that you've been out on the piss the whole time so where did you go and how much did you drink well it's not we didn't actually go very far i mean th there is a the hotel in which we stayed at is literally on the other side of the car park to the synchronous office okay no. but because we've actually been really really busy getting ready for a certain uh, trade show taking place in right. a couple of weeks time and also trying to um make sure that we have you know a, a decent show for those guys as we possibly can you know, there's a lot of work that's going in behind the scenes but um we didn't we actually just went to a went to a steakhouse i mean we, we turned up on tuesday came back thursday went to a steakhouse on wednesday night okay um and it was actually you know, by by mary standards it was relatively 
relatively vegetarian, actually. In terms okay. Of, yeah, it was good. And not too late. Which is a I strange mean, like thing her... to say in a steakhouse, isn't it? But yes. Yeah, it was it was a little bit unplugged, you know, to use a kind of okay. a, a musical term. And like her, her Mobile Congress dinner tends to go on until about two in the morning. Are these kind of times we're dealing with here? Oh, I'd say so, yeah. yeah. I, think, okay. I think there's an element. She put in a decent shift. It's about saving ourselves for the, for, 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 for the big show, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right, I won't, I won't dig any further. <laughs> um, so, yes, I was out and about. I, uh, again, just like you, over to the States, but for a short amount of time, I went even further to the West Coast. I was over in uh, San Diego. Uh, first time I've ever been to sort of Qualcomm Towers over in, in San Diego, and they're basically putting on a big 5G fest. And of course, you know, as you know, we, we've certainly been plenty cynical on this podcast about it. Everyone's banging on about 5G, but to be fair, Qualcomm's one of the companies that's, that has actually has something to say on the matter, rather than just trying to position itself uh, sort of rock next to it to sort of get some reflected glory. Um, and yeah, the, the sort of principal aim was for them to sort of go how great their 5G modem, this X50, is and, and how ahead of the game it is. Qualcomm reckons it's about a year or two ahead of, um, of uh, competitive modem guys. So we're talking specifically modem as opposed to application processors like the rest of the Snapdragon bit. Um, and I've got no reason to not believe them, to be honest. You know, that is what Qualcomm does. That has been what it's been very good at for quite a while. Um, and it's mainly, you know, I think something like 80 or 90% of its headcount is just R&D people. So that's what it does. Um, so that was all good. But what, what I thought was interesting in the context of that is a piece I just wrote today, sort of following up from it, because they've got all kinds of crazy stuff going on around them at the moment, Qualcomm. They've been in sort of disputes with Apple, mm -hmm. which has got to be, if not its biggest, then one of its biggest. I read something today that it accounts for about 20% of its business, just Apple. Um, it's been a dispute with them for a while. And there's, they're appealing the decision too, aren't they? Yeah, and so, well, that's, I was just going to lead up to that. They also keep getting done by um, regulators, although by the sounds of it, half the time, the only reason regulators got interested is because Apple's grasped them up in the first place. So there's basically there's this negotiation that's getting increasingly sort of hostile and gloves off between them. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that decision, I think I might have mentioned it before, but that decision in Europe where they got done for you know, allegedly giving Apple money under the table to not go with anyone else was hilarious because, you know, firstly, they're in dispute with Apple. It made me wonder whether or not they decide to stop giving them the brown envelopes, and that's why it all kicked off. But at second, but secondly, how come Apple doesn't get done? I mean, they were the recipient of this supposed sort of dodgy pay payments. Why isn't it worth bo both ways? And I think that's the basis of their appeal against that. And then at the same time, they got Broadcom trying to acquire them, and they put in a bid last November, which everyone reckoned was too low. But while I was away, they significantly hoiked it up um, to a level that investors might find interesting. So now Qualcomm's having to sort of increasingly appeal to its own shareholders and go, look, I know this might look a bit tempting, but, you know, just bear with us. We'll be really great once 5G kicks in. Sounds like the rest of the industry, doesn't it? Yeah. Once 5G kicks in, everything will be great. Yeah. Um, but another thing they were sort of demonstrating to me was also their attempts at sort of diversification away from being primarily a sort of modem and to a lesser extent sort of application processor company and into all sorts of other areas like like sort of clever 3D audio or or VR or um, uh, there were gaming uh, or, or smart cars or whatever you know if seeing as we expect in the IoT the 5G IoT era for everything to be smart in inverted commas. It stands to reason that everything will have a chip in it. And so Qualcomm's going, why can't they be one of our chips? Mm -hmm. Which I think is a perfectly plausible diversification argument, whether it pulls it off, as there will be quite a lot of other people trying the same game, uh, remains to be seen. So, yeah, that's what I did there. You I'm feeling like quite their chances, though, haven't you? I mean, you think that the resources at their disposal, albeit you know, they're, they're, a, they're, a wounded, they're a wounded animal at the moment, <clears throat> I mean, what they've achieved. Yeah, well, I think they've got an R&D advantage. Uh, and I think, you know, we've we've spoken before and there are third parties who will sort of confirm that R&D advantage. Um, I guess it just remains to be seen how much that translates to sort of bottom line. So, for example, from the ASP side, there might have been a, a time sort of 10 years ago, 5, 10 years ago, when Snapdragons would crop up in most phones. Mm -hmm. But since then, we've got Apple designing its own chips, Samsung is, Huawei is... Um, you're getting other people designing their own chips because ARM um, puts so many tools in place to enable people to do their own chips. So there's less going on there. But but the one thing no one else um, is doing independently is their own modems. That seems to be a more specialised thing. 
that ARM can only do so much to help people out with. So there we've got principal competitors are, are Intel and MediaTek. And Intel certainly trying to make as much noise as possible about 5G and you know, mm -hmm. judging by the amount of um, pleas to meet them at MOA Congress I've had that you know they're really keen to go on about that. But you know, they got, I'm not saying they won't, but they got to prove it. Yeah. It was the same as when they were trying to get into ASPs about five years ago. It's not even good enough for them to be as good as Qualcomm. They've got to be better. Otherwise, why should they shift the momentum? Why should people who've already got this supplier relationship with Qualcomm take the risk of moving suppliers? Mm. So, um, so yeah, that's the thing there. And uh, so Jamie's been uh, all on his own all week manning the fort. Um, but you've been covering a few little Qualcomm stories. Have you got any sort of perspectives on all the trials and tribulations they're going through at the moment? No, not really. Um, it's just, you know, the only thing I covered on them this week was about the broad, uh, Broadcom uh, side of things. Um, and it's, you know, I think, it I think it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to happen eventually. I'm, I'm amazed that investors aren't really sort of trying to push the management team towards it. Right. Um, that's a new level of 82 bucks a share. Yeah, 82. You know, it said, it said between what, like 80 and 82, which would value it anywhere between, so I think it was 121 and 125 yeah. billion. And, you know, you just got to think, how much, how much money, how much is that going to be worth if the rumours turn out to be true and Apple has, uh, drops it as a supplier? Yeah. And, you know, I think you would, you read somewhere earlier today that it's 20% of their bottom line yeah, is right, yeah. Apple. You know, you lose 20% of the business. I, you know, what what sort of business is that going to be moving forward? It's certainly yeah. not going to be on the top table anymore. Um, yeah. You know, why why aren't they why aren't they taking this bid from Broadcom more seriously? And the other thing, it was so it was it was two sources from Reuters uh, who came who went to Reuters yeah. that uncovered this. Um, you know. Broadcom might be upper in their offer, and it, they turned around and said, "Yeah, but don't get too excited because Tan can turn around and uh, and veto this and drop the price right down again if he decides to." Right. Um, so it might. I I personally think it's just Broadcom, yeah, putting the feelers out, trying to get excitement up, and then all of a sudden, Apple invest. Uh, sorry, Qualcomm investors get really disappointed when the price drops dramatically. Well, but so when the price goes back up again, they really snap it up. Could be. I mean, that's they have put in speculation there, Jamie. <laughs> I think well, so. But they have put in the formal bid at that bookie. level. <laughs> <laughs> they have put in the formal bid at that level, so I don't know how much wriggle room that gives them to dick about subsequently. Another thing I think is interesting, and oh, I mean, they can still turn it down though, can't they? Well, I mean, if, Qualcomm if, has. No, no, no. But I mean, Broadcom can still okay. turn around and go. Well, we'll change actually, our mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know you. Your your the future of your business is looking shite. Right. So we're gonna you know we don't think you're valued at 121 billion right, anymore. We enough. can drop it. Yeah, there's a lot of dicking about. One thing I wanted to say and then and then ask your view on it, Paul, is just some of the. I think we all know that nearly all leaks, especially in in the sort of business press as opposed to political press, or that probably applies there as well. They're not, you know, they're not some sort of Woodward and Bernstein deep throat. There's, these are very controlled, deliberate um, leaks. You know, and I thought. When I was just writing it up earlier on today, I thought, okay, so just as all this is happening, just as a new Broadcom bid's coming in, just as all this stuff's kicking off, it happens to get leaked that Apple is thinking of bailing. Uh, and there's, there is a view that, that Apple would be quite keen on Broadcom buying Qualcomm because then it's got a whole ton of its component suppliers in one place and it can screw that down even more. And there's nothing Tim Cook likes more than shafting suppliers. Oh, yeah. Um, so... Uh, so yeah, I just I want to know your view as a, as a communications professional on some of that sort of darker messaging on some some of this stuff just coming out. It sort of fascinates me how these decisions yeah, are made. It's, it's all very very carefully calculated, and it's actually part part of it. You know, yeah. it's part part of the communications game these days. And I do call it a game because it is. It's all about. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. You've got to be pretty sure of yourself, you know, to go and do something that carries that amount of risk, but. From what I see, I mean, most of the leaks that you see, it doesn't always get you know driven by the source that that you'd expect, right? And yeah. uh, there's quite often a bit of maliciousness at play in terms of yeah, people with alter alternative yeah. agendas, driven by disgruntled shareholders or you name it, whatever. Yeah, um, it all plays a part, you know. And I think that it's a, it's a very very difficult thing to have to manage, and it will always be there. Yeah. I'd like it if more of these people s express more scepticism about the source of the leak, actually. Because one, one of the things this whole leak industry relies on 
is this stuff just being reported unquestioningly to a certain degree mm. um and you know and that's a balancing act you know we don't we don't we're not really the recipient of much of this sort of thing but let's say i was working at reuters or ft or whatever and i get a leak and it's quite obviously a leak with an agenda yeah i would like to see him put a little bit of a caveat just at the end goes you know then again it's quite convenient for certain people for this stuff to be suddenly out in the public domain yeah so it's a, so it's a pitch disguised as a leak <laughs> yeah sort of which, which happens all too often right yeah yeah, yeah exactly. particularly with the massive uh, you know incumbents and the multinational corporations you know yeah and, the, and and they've got the and they've got the resources to sort of properly think this stuff through okay um we're starting to run out of time so i'm going to hand the ball over to jamie what have been your highlights while i've been swanning around in southern california um well i mean twitter had their uh their annual results first profit ever yes um and it was just literally a case of they made it easy for people to buy advertising off them right Duh. um you know that was an interesting one whereas um, they've previously been sort of throwing all sorts of obstacles well, in the past. Isn't, isn't that part of the digital transformation <laughs> well, dream as well well i, I was going to say paul this this is sounding well, like the, like the drum you've been beating <laughs> and how specifically did they just come up with better products or just no no it was just it was just um sort of different features and ways to buy the product so right. it was like helping small businesses uh you know with automated campaigns that sort of thing right um you know subscription services for advertising agencies um you know these sorts of these sorts of these sorts of like little ideas i can't remember what the rest of them right no worries um i had to dig quite deep into the Mm. shareholder letter to find out what they were actually doing um they weren't very forthcoming with their press release but you know it was uh, you know it was there and thereabouts um, elsewhere in the world, Huawei had a bit of a dig at um, governments around the world, what, saying, what? I think it was Ryan, uh, sorry, yeah, Ryan Ding, who's the president of services and products, I think it is, in uh, in their carrier business. Right. Um, and he just turned around and said, governments need to help and encourage operators to spend more money. Uh, whether it's through PPPs right. or through... So um, no vested interest there then? Yeah, what? yeah, or tax it? rebates or anything like that. Yeah. But then he turned around and said, you know, at the end of the day, Spectrum costs too much, um, oh, okay. except in every place, like, uh, except in China and Japan. Um, Isn't there a bit of element of pot kettle black as far as uh, you know, the links between Huawei and the Chinese government and uh, what they think about what everybody else is doing? Or was, it just, was that just lost on No, 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 they, they, they quote Japan, uh, Japan as well. They did. So it's not okay. just the But they did turn around and say, you know, if you look at the physical 4G sites that they put up over the last couple of years in China, China Mobile put up 1.7 million sites across the country. And he said yeah. that's the reason why... 4G coverage is really good in China. Right. And he said, if you look at the number of physical sites that went up across Europe and North America in the same period, it still doesn't match China mm. Mobile's expansion. So, some, yeah. so I mean, some of that so, is, seems to be them sort of extolling the virtues of the sort of centralised, undemocratic planned economy that they have in China, which I probably has. And, and the Japanese... You yeah, yeah that's you, right. you can't just limit this on China. I know, but you, you, were, you were talking, you cited China Mobile as an example. So I'm going to run with that. And, um, <laughs> right, so you're going to just ignore the rest of it and just <laughs> focus on the part that suits your arguments. Well, that's all that you mentioned was China <laughs> I, And the Japanese. On, talking, f- we, feel free to mention I that. haven't got an example, but, right. I'm t- but he t- it talks about the, the Japanese and the Chinese governments okay, have well, a lower spectrum cost. If, <laughs> and if that's it, why. If it's all right, I'll just run with the Chinese point I was going to make. You two have got to stop is, flirting. Which it's is there is this sort of planned economy. So things like access to sites, access to public land, all that sort of thing, is going to be made a lot more, a lot easier when you've just got one lot of. Um, sort of autocrats running the but show, it, but it's the same in the UK as well. Because the, so the last Communications Act actually forced through a um, a clause that said that when you have certain mobile sites um, that are on private lands, the government can force the landowner yeah. to sell. So it's not. No, an operator's been lobbying at that <laughs> yeah. for a while. So I'm assuming that Huawei's well, making the point that you still need to do better. Well, they, they're just—they're basically saying stop spending. Like the reason 4G took a long time to roll out is that you know obviously operators are looking for as much help as possible, and if you charge them or you put a minimum bid on this much on this asset or this mm. spectrum band, they're going to have less money to spend yeah. on kit. And, and obviously, obviously for a for a, a vendor who sells into operators, operators having a lot more money would be a good thing, yeah. wouldn't it? But it also goes full circle, you know. If they didn't charge so much for Spectrum, 
the operators wouldn't be so skint mm. and then at the same time they wouldn't be begging the government for PPPs and tax rebates and encouragements to possibly to spend I more. I suspect they would anyway. Yeah, they probably but, would, um, but yeah, no, I mean it's it's not an unreasonable. However much you start to sell like a GSMA white paper, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> As he, he said, with bitter past experience, I presume. Oh, I'm not um, bitter at all. The yeah, I mean, just because someone's got a vested interest, as Huawei clearly does, in there being more money sloshing around in the area it's trying to sell into, doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, there probably there probably is more the government's good. You know, we're getting this a lot with with all the five G stuff, and every now and then you'll get some set of people like a GSMA or we've got all these other acronym groups in mm. Europe haven't we that mm. are all, have all got some kind of interest and they're all saying well more should be done Etno and stuff like yeah, that exactly, yeah that sort of thing um, I suppose the flip side to me you know and Jamie and I both sort of tend to be reasonably sceptical about people who start pleading for sort of public money and that sort of thing but yeah the flip side to me is um, it is, that's only one factor I think uh, there are there are probably a lot more back to going full circle back to perhaps one of the areas of your research that there is still more that operators could do to help themselves. Do you uh, agree? Of course, yeah, yeah. But I think that you know it, t- time is the healer, right? I mean, you just, the longer the longer they keep trying to do something, eventually they're going to find a way of doing it, and it's uh, and th- once they've done that, they'll never look back. And it's mm-hmm. just a case of how long will that <laughs> how long is that going to take? But, Sorry, I mean this is this is something else. Yeah, it, it, the longer they're looking at it, they're look they're constantly looking for that silver bullet. Well, it's to your point earlier, Jamie. That's right. Yeah. But uh, but I don't think. I mean, there is no silver bullet. With 5G. It's marginal gains. You know, yeah. uh, all of the kind of well-worn, measured migration on a digital transformation journey. It's I'll take you by the hand. I'll it's show you the light. We'll all go. We're in it together. But it's it's fifty use cases Excellent that will buzzwords. bring the ROI back. Yeah. You know, it's not one. You know, they can't just upgrade everyone to yeah. 4G like this and then they get their money back. You know, there's 50 different use cases that if you look at it all together in the big picture, which I think is what the telcos are terrible at doing, yeah. um, yeah. then, they'll, then there'll be justification for 5G. And that's exactly the point. You know, the ability to all together look at the big picture together and actually coming up with a kind of common set of principles yeah. as a collective. That The inability to do that is why we're in the situation that's we're in at the moment. It's because they're, they're not paying enough attention to the trade press, I think. Well, absolutely, yeah. Or they've just got terrible PR advice. <laughs> <laughs> and on that self-interested note, <laughs> we're getting throat-cutting gestures from Pierre. So uh, we're going to have to call it a day there. Thanks a lot for coming in, Paul. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having um, me, guys. And uh, thanks a lot for listening. Make sure you join us for the next one.